So here we are for our third uh, executive questions and answers. I'm joined once again by our executive team, so I'll hand over to them to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Carol Carter, I'm Chief Executive. Hi, I'm Carol Williams and I'm the Operations Director. Hi, I'm Gareth Jones, I'm Director of Development and Assets. Hi, I'm Gloria Young, I'm the Director of Finance. Brilliant. So again, this month we had around 200 questions that came in by text or email. So thank you to everyone that sent them in. As we've said previously, what we'll do is we've put the questions into kind of themes. So it may not be your individual question, but it fits into one of these themes that we're going to talk about. Also, if you left your details, one of the teams within Origin will come back to you directly to answer your question. OK, so I will launch straight into the questions then. So we've had some around COVID-19. What financial support are we able to offer people if they have been furloughed? Um, I'll get this one. Um, I think this remains a very challenging period for us all. Um, so please speak to us, to our uh, income team, our financial support team, who have been providing welfare and benefit advice tailored one-to-one -one based on your individual cases. So our number is 0300 323 0325. Uh, we've also set up a dedicated page on our website for frequently asked questions regarding financial support. You could find this page by going onto our website and under the section for residents and coronavirus. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, previously, we've talked about service charge refunds. What will be the process for looking at any refunds due and how will we go about refunding people? So um, we've set up a service disruption register, which is reviewed monthly by the managers and executive team. And um, for the first quarter, and um, thank you very much for our staff and contractors working, um, we haven't experienced a significant service disruption. Um, so if there were a delay for some services, a catch up services has been planned for this year. So we'll continue to review the service charge register on a monthly basis. But in the meantime, if there are any uh, service issues, please do let us know. OK, how have um, neighbourhood managers been communicating with people during lockdown as they haven't been able to visit residents? Uh, so I'll take this one. Um, so obviously through necessity, we've had to do most of our communication through emails and phone calls to our residents. But in some cases, we have still continued to go out to visit on some of more important cases. Um, what we'll be doing is um, continuing to uh, com communicate with our residents through phones and emails. And we're using our Skype calls and video calls as well where we can, if, if our um, residents have that facility themselves, then we're really happy to um, make those calls in using that forum. And only this week, we've actually launched our virtual appointment system and service for all our residents who they can use, can use that to contact their neighborhood managers and the um, home ownership team if they want to. Okay, thank you. Um, are we opening our receptions and community centres? Yes, we're currently working on um, opening Evershaw Street. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that it's safe not only for our customers and residents, but also for our staff. So we've got a few things that we need to do to make sure that happens. Um, but we're hoping we'll be able to get it open in a few weeks. Um, just really to say that when it is open, the service that we'll be able to offer might be different to what people would be used to. So what we will be able to do is obviously take messages and make sure those get on to the right people. And we're also aiming to be able to help through um, using digital platforms to be able to report anything as well. And we will want to have staff to be able to help our residents to use those platforms if they came into our office. Uh, what we won't have, though, is the neighborhood manager or the maintenance surveyor at the office at the same time. So I would still encourage people to use all the current methods of getting in touch with us so that we can get you more quickly and directly to the person you want to speak to um, rather than coming into Evershult Street. With our community centres, I'm sure that you would 
want us to make sure that they are really safe for anyone that's using them. So we are carrying out risk assessments at the minute of all our community centres, uh, really trying to understand the impacts it would have on what groups we could let use those, um, what we'd have to do between groups of people using the facilities, um, and just how this would impact on that. Um, so we just want to take a bit of time, and I think I would probably say that we wouldn't be looking to open those up till the earliest September, but it might be later than that. But just to reassure you that we are working on that at this moment. Great. Thanks, Carol. And uh, finally, in the COVID section, um, are we resuming all services now? Well, what I would say to that is that we haven't stopped any services. What might have happened is that we might have been delivering them differently. But we've really tried to work with every resident to provide the same service as we've done before. So as way of example, whilst repairs, some people may want us to come into their properties to carry those out and others may not, we've still offered all those full services. So my view answer on that is everything is the same, but how we deliver it might be just slightly different. Great, thank you. Um, so we had some questions around repairs. Uh, the first one is, how do we ensure our contractors are completing repairs to a high standard, and what happens if they don't? Okay, so that's me again, I think. Um, so with our repair service, we've always carried out what we call post inspections. That's where one of our surveyors will go into the property, um, and a percentage of our properties, not all of them, and look at the repair. And we're doing that to look at, one, has it been done, and the standard of it, and also to make sure that we are getting good value for money from our contractor. So we again have carried on doing that through this current period. What we've had to do though is to use, um, ask our residents to help us with that. And what we've done is they've been able to send us photographs of the repairs um, so that we can prove that they've been done. But also we've, we've also increased the number of calls to residents to make sure that they're happy with repairs um, during this time. So I think what we've done is actually evidence that we can do this in a different way in future. And this is something that we'd want to roll out further so that we could actually post inspect more repairs um, longer term rather than going back to the percentage that we do now. Great, thanks. We had a comment come in as well that says, uh, with your repair service, shouldn't you be prioritising the elderly or vulnerable people? Absolutely, and um, we do. And what we'd encourage people to do is to let us know whenever they're reporting that repair if they would fall under one of those groupings. Um, but what I'm really pleased about is that in April we were due to re release our new service model on repairs with Gil Martins, our contractor. And that was to try and aim to make sure that every time a person phoned in or contacted us with a repair, they finished that communication knowing when that repair was going to be carried out. So they'd have an appointment booked there and then. That actually has worked really well through this period. And what we've been able to do is offer people appointments really, really quickly. And over 40% of all repairs being reported to us at the minute are being done within either the first day or the second day after they've reported it. So we're really pleased that this new service model is actually making it available for residents to have their repairs done more quickly, whether they are vulnerable or not vulnerable. Okay, great. Thanks. Julie, can I just add something around repair standards that um, people often ex assume that if a contractor has to go back to fix something that we're paying more for that repair, um, but the arrangement we have with our main contractor means that we don't pay any more. So if they have to go back and fix something because it wasn't done correctly the first time, that doesn't mean an extra cost. Um, and just to encourage people, if they feel that the work hasn't been done to the right standard, to let us know. And if they can send a, a, a video or a photograph, that, that is really helpful. Okay, great. Thanks. So I'll move on to what we call planned maintenance. When will we be starting kitchen bathroom replacements and how will we prioritise that? 
Okay, <clears throat> so we're still of the opinion that we can't comply with the safe distancing rules to carry out replacements in kitchen and bathrooms in occupied flats. Um, and what this involves is having more than one operative in the property for an extended period. And this differs from carrying out a single responsive repair or even a fire door replacement, which we do believe we can carry out safely. Um, we're currently looking at the, the rules as they apply and looking to recommence early in 2021 and inevitably will prioritise those kitchens and bathrooms that most in need of replacement at that time due to primarily age or condition. Um, I think what we'll say in the meantime is that anybody that has um, a situation in the kitchen and bathrooms that needs an, an urgent repair uh, to make sure it's usable still, that they report that through to the uh, call centre as usual um, and a, 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 an immediate repair will be carried out to address that. But we'll be in touch with people closer to the time when that programme recommences. Okay, great. Thanks, Gareth. Um, so the next sort of section is around communal areas in my neighbourhood. Um, so one of the questions that came in was around what can you use communal areas such as gardens for and has that changed at all since lockdown? I think that's back to myself for that one. Um, nothing has changed um, during lockdown. Um, I think probably what's been more apparent through the period is that because there were so many restrictions on where people could go, that actually if there was something like a communal garden around a block of flats, then people probably were using it more during um, lockdown than maybe in the past. Um, and obviously we would want to encourage people through that period to use the, the gardens, obviously keeping to all the guidelines, social distancing, etc., that were in place at the time, um, because people were very restricted in where they could go, um, and everybody needs to get out of their property at some point to get a bit of fresh air um, so it probably feels like it's changed or it's different but I think that maybe was more about the circumstances that we were in at the time. Just uh, just to add to that you know recognizing the points that Carol was made that um, you know we, we would ask people to sort of you know bear in mind the impact they're having on their neighbours obviously so yeah. you know yeah. if it's a large group of people and it's quite noisy obviously that's going to have an impact on people in their home so we do ask people to respect their neighbours. Great, thanks. Some of the people that came back to us said they had some concerns around safety on estates. So uh, a couple of questions here. Can a resident install CCTV and what are we doing about estate safety generally? So I think I think that comes around to a couple of things, doesn't it? And a lot of um, what we've seen over the last period has been a, a large increase in the amount of antisocial behaviour being reported to us. Um, and um, I think that was inevitable in a way that there would be um, an increase of noise and other things happening around our estates when everybody was um, enclosed and not able to go out as much as they, they would normally have done. And what we've always encouraged is that everybody reports things to us and then we can can advise uh, what actions we can take and also what we can do with other agencies and how we will work in partnership with other agencies, whether that's the police or the local authorities, um, to, to ensure that things get dealt with and to ensure that um, everyone can have that peace and quiet that they want. Um, and you know, a lot of what we do is, as Carol mentioned just a minute ago, is asking people to respect one another and to, to really think about the impact maybe they're having on their neighbours at this time and as in all times. Um, you can install CCTV um, yourself. You do need to get permission from us to do it, but it is limited as you're only really able to have the CCTV pointing at your own front door. You're not allowed to have it out onto the street and out onto the corridors, etc., where those are public domains. Um, so please, if you want to do something like that, do contact us first and get permission so that we can give you all the advice on that. We do ourselves install CCTV and we do have programs of doing this. So again, if you feel that you um, if you live in a, an area where you think we should put CCTV in and we haven't got that at the minute, then again, please do contact us through our customer services centre um, and our neighbourhood managers will obviously look into that for you. Great, thanks. And as a bit of a follow on from that, um, what do people do if they witness ASB and what are we doing about the reports of ASB? Okay, so please report them to us um, through our call centre. And the reason I say to go through our call centre is because they log every inquiry that we get in what we call a general inquiry. 
And that means that from the minute you phoned us or sent us an email, then that is logged and we know that we've had that communication. And that then is given to our neighborhood managers and they will contact you directly to discuss your complaint your, uh, around antisocial behavior. And from that, we will be able to advise you what we can and can't do. And as I said, it needs to, we need to work in partnership with other agencies. We can't solve it all ourselves. Um, and some of it we have no control over and no um, means of taking actions against them. So we do need to work with the police, with the local authorities to see who is the best agency to deal with an issue. But there's a lot of things that come through to us where really the best way of dealing with it is to discuss it with your neighbours. Um, and to be able to talk to one another about the impacts that you're maybe having or maybe people are receiving. So we'll always look to a wide variety of solutions and offer as many as we can to help. Great, thanks. And then sort of final question on that is, can I see photos of my neighbourhood manager or cleaner and how do I know if they've visited our building? That's a really good question. I would think, and I would like to think that what we could do was to make sure that you do get those pictures. I don't think we provide those at the minute, so I think it's a really good point for us to, to make sure we get on our websites and, um, and through other means to get out to everybody. Um, we're also at the minute investigating the opportunity to have um, notice boards, electronic notice boards in our blocks of flats. Now, it's not something we're going to have tomorrow, but again, it's a really exciting thing to look forward to for the future. And that would be, make it really easy for us to be able to show those photographs and, and to give lots more information um, to you all in your blocks. With the cleaners, the cleaners are, um, there is a notice board in most blocks and the cleaners do record on that when they have been at the block and when they've cleaned it. Um, and obviously that's important for you to all know that they've been there, but also it's important for us to know that they've been there. Um, so please, if that's not happening, then come back to us um, directly and we'll make sure that that gets put up in your blocks. And just on that, Carol, just thinking about what's been done around estate inspections in this period, because mm -hmm. that's another way that people can see that our staff are out and about. So do you want to say a bit about that as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So obviously, we've continued to carry out our estate inspections. Um, and I think it's probably now about two or three weeks ago, we advertised that we'd set up a mailbox for our estate inspectors, for anybody who wanted to get in touch with them directly um, and to tell us about things that you'd like us to look at on your estate. So if I could just ask people if they want to, please use that forum to come back to us. Um, and as restrictions are starting to, you know, get less, um, you know, we will be trying to get back to an opportunity where we can do our estate inspections with our residents or anyone that wants to join us on those. Obviously, we can't still do it at the minute, but we're really working towards bringing that back. Um, so thank you on that. Great, thank you. Um, so we've got a few general questions uh, to go through. So uh, a couple of people have said, I have asked a question before and no one has come back to me yet. And, and that's really disappointing to hear that come back to us. Um, we do, as I said earlier, log all our inquiries using what's called our general inquiries process. And from that, we can track when that came in, who we gave that to, and when they replied to us. Um, and I really, really, you know, I'm disappointed to hear that comment coming back to us. But I would stress if you want to make inquiries with us, then please go through our call centre so that we can log them all. And just to say, uh, you mentioned at the beginning, Julie, that we'll come back to people when they've raised individual questions. Okay. So if there's anyone who's, who's mentioned that in, in the questions this time, we will make sure that they're contacted. Yeah, OK. Um, some people have mentioned that they've raised a complaint and have yet to hear back to us. So I thought perhaps we could explain what the process is for when someone raises a complaint and what happens. OK. Um, so when we receive a complaint, and it doesn't matter how we receive it, you can write to us, you can send an email, you can phone us up, it doesn't matter how you contact us. We then, again, log that in what's known as our CRM system, our Customer Resolution Management System. And we triage that within 24 hours of receiving it. So we will therefore write back to the customer advising who we've passed the complaint to. 
The person who gets that complaint then has nine working days to respond to it. Now, during that nine days, what we expect our staff to do is to phone or contact um, the complainant, to discuss the complaints, to understand what we can do to rectify it, and then the response will go out after that to say what we're doing. And hopefully, the two will marry up. That's what we're aiming to do, is make sure that we deal with the complaint and manage it and, um, and solve it for our customer, our resident. So that's the process. Um, we monitor our complaints monthly. Um, the executive team get details off uh, how we're doing on our complaints. Um, and our response times on them are pretty good. We do um, miss a few of the sort of nine days. Um, but um, what we ask our staff to do is if it's going to take longer to look at that complaint, that they advise the resident um, in advance of that and come to an agreement with the resident of when they will get that response out. Um, we also send a survey to our residents after uh, they've had uh, given us a complaint. Um, and it's really useful if residents do complete that and tell us about how the process of the complaint was for them. So, did you get the phone calls? Did you manage to get the, um, the response in the time frame that we've said? Um, and did you feel that you were involved in that whole complaint process as well? And just some encouragement for people to um, contact us through customer services because we can be sure then that the, in the inquiries get logged. Um, so I can understand why our residents might want to contact individuals directly, um, often by email. Uh, sometimes that can mean that an issue doesn't get logged. Um, so if we can encourage people go, to go through customer services, then that's the best chance of making sure that we respond in a timely way. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we had a couple of questions come in about um, HS2 or High Speed Rail 2. The first one is, will there be a rent reduction for those affected by the HS2 works? Julie, I think I'll take both questions together. So what is happening to affected residents and will be a rent reduction? We've just recently received some notifications from residents they've received from HS2 advising of works that are likely to take place in the next 12 months. Uh, most of the people being contacted are where their property is within 100 feet or 30 metres of the works taking place um, and just notifying that the, these are about to, to, to take place. In, in, this is mainly in Camden uh, and most of the works taking place are either in tunnels or in excavations uh, near the homes. Um, HS2 have an obligation to advise residents of what's happening and keep them updated throughout the works. Uh, and they also have an obligation to uh, rectify any damage that may be caused by the works as well. The actions we're taking currently is to explore the uh, possibility of uh, further remediation works being available um, to attenuate any noise, particularly things like secondary glazing. Um, and we're talking to HS2 currently as to which properties may be eligible for those additional works. Um, we're also going to be taking um, some uh, uh, documentary evidence and photos and some survey evidence of the existing condition of properties. So uh, we can then sort of uh, verify if there is any uh, movements or settlements in buildings where these works are taking place that we can evidence that and uh, get the appropriate uh, rectification done. I think it's important that um, anybody who's receiving these notifications send them on to us because we're not guaranteed to get these ourselves. In the past, it hasn't been consistent that HS2 have contacted us directly as well. So, um, you know, request everybody there. If they do get a notification of the works, they please send it in to us um, uh, as soon as they can so we can uh, take the necessary action. Do we want them to send it in to customer services, Gareth? Initially, yes, and they'll, they'll send it out there to the, the correct team. Great, thank you. Uh, and just to say, we, we do have uh, communications and contact with HS2, so it's not that we don't have contact. It's more about the fact that the uh, communication with us isn't as, as uh, consistent as we'd like it to be. Um, and clearly, we want to make sure that you know if um, residents um, you know could be adversely affected, that HS2 take the necessary steps to uh, take precautions and prevent that. Okay, and then we had some questions about home ownership as well. Uh, the first one is: I have cladding on my building. Will I be able to sell my home? 
Yeah, this is a hugely topical question at the moment, and it does affect many thousands of households across the country. Um, the simple answer is yes, you will be able to sell your building, but the building will have to undergo a specific review process that's currently required by mortgage companies to confirm that there are no issues with the cladding. Um, the original focus of concern was limited to taller buildings and to a, a specific form of cladding called ACM, a type of which which was installed on the Grenfell Tower. Um, the focus has been widened following recent government guidance to other types of cladding uh, installed on a wider range of different size buildings uh, and even now includes balcony materials as well following a recent fire last year in Barking. Uh, there is a standard review process to produce a form called an EWS1 form, which has to be provided by a certified engineer. This will either sign off the building as safe or identify some additional work required to make the building comply with current regulations. The main issue we have currently is the volume of work involved in this. Origin, like lots of the housing organisations, have a large number of properties that are affected by this, and it won't be possible to get round to all of these immediately where potentially these need a, a cladding review. Uh, where we are approached to carry out um, such a review, uh, we will endeavour to respond as quickly as possible, uh, but we'll have to prioritise these in, in order of uh, perceived risk. Um, this will reflect the height and method of construction and occupation of the building, for example. The, I mean, this, this is a problem that's not going away, and in fact, it seems to get bigger uh, over time as well, with the number of people affected. So, um, you know, we just hope at the moment that the mortgage companies and governments can agree uh, an alternative and easy, easier method to sign off uh, buildings, uh, because otherwise, it is restricting people's ability to either remortgage or, in some cases, move properties. Okay, great. Thanks. Who do I talk to about right to buy, and am I able to buy my own property? So currently, um, th th there is no active right to buy scheme in place for housing associations. Um, the last government uh, considered this and, and, and started some pilot studies, and the current government has discussed this as well. But currently, there is no equivalent right to buy uh, system in place that council tenants can take a, a, a advantage of for housing association residents. And, and there's no immediate prospects of that coming in. Um, some properties may be eligible for something called right to acquire, which provides an, a, an amount of, it's, it's around about £16,000. Um, that people can apply for to uh, enable them to buy another property um, and uh, and get that help in buying. So, in obviously, you know, how affordable that makes a, a, a view to buy a property in London and the areas we work in is kind of debatable. But that's the only system that's currently in place for our residents to take advantage of. Great, and I'll throw this open to all of the exec team. Uh, will COVID nineteen affect property prices? I, I must admit, I can only offer you a, opinions and. A, advice that other commentators are providing this as well rather than a definite yes or no answer to this question because obviously it's dependent on, uh, on many elements. Um, the, the people like Savills have uh, issued recent reports um, and I'll, I'll quote from them. So their current view is that in the current year, all regions of the country are likely, the property market is likely to experience some sort of effect. Um, and this may partly reflect the fact that the, the, the sales market was effectively closed down during the kind of the, the height of the lockdown period recently and no properties were selling. Um, but it also you know, it must also uh, reflect the fact that the property market is part of the wider economy. Um, we don't quite know what is going to happen to the economy. There's lots of talk about um, whether there'll be a recession, whether there'll be more unemployment. That obviously is going to affect demand for properties. Um, the government have tried to respond. Um, recently they've announced that the SDLT um, for properties under £500,000 uh, will be uh, not charged until March 2021 in, in, in order to try and promote the market and uh, keep it going. Um, there's a small matter of Brexit around the corner, of course, no one quite knows what's happening with that, but it's a bit unknown. Um, but the general view is that, that this year will, will, be, will be impacted, uh, but then the subsequent years, next three, two or three years, are the, the view of the commentators who I'll defer to is that it will be fairly balanced, although it won't be increasing hugely anytime soon. I don't know if anybody else has got a, a, a different view to that. I think you summed it up really well, Gareth. <laughs> and not I a different view. 
<laughs> and uh, clearly location, 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 you know, it's always um, one of the things demand um, about property prices. And if you think about origin for an organization, we work in such high um, housing demand area, Camden, Nunfield, you know, there's always a, a large um, waiting list for any of our properties. So in that sense, you know, the demand we don't see can go away anywhere. So if you really want to put a value to those properties, um, you know, I don't believe the property prices will be changed greatly. And especially as Gary said, you know, yesterday the Chancellor's announcement for stamp duty exemption for property up to a press bracket will obviously support, you know, that starter bracket of the housing property to sustain the price. Okay, and finally, we did have a couple of comments thanking uh, the exec team for how they'd handled the COVID-19 crisis and the work that we're doing. And, you know, also massive thanks to all of our frontline staff that have been out there delivering services during this time. So thank you very much to the executive team for taking part. Um, is there anything you guys would like to add before we finish? Just like to say uh, thanks for the uh, the opportunity to answer residents' questions. We really do value the feedback that we get, um, and it gives us a really good idea about um, people's uh, concerns and priorities, uh, which we can then use to make sure that we're focusing on the right things. So please do keep the questions coming, and if you do have individual concerns, and clearly you can raise them through this route, but you can also use our other channels as well, contacting customer services and using our, our website. So thank you very much again.